Thank you for joining me here today to talk about RDA, Resource Description and Access. I'm Emily Nimzikant, the Cataloging Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, we've got a lot of material to cover. Um, I plan for the webinar to last about two hours. Um, I do, I did plan to allow plenty of times for questions. I know that this is a new topic and a lot of people will probably have questions, so please do not hesitate to ask your questions as we go along. You can either type them into the question box if you want to type them, or if you have a microphone, you can also ask them. Currently, all of your microphones are muted, so if you have a question and you'd like to ask it over your microphone, um, either type something into the question box that you want me to unmute you, or there's a little raise your hand icon. If you raise your hand, I will see that, and I can unmute your microphone, and you can ask your question that way. All right, so let's get started with RDA. And this is kind of a basic outline of what I want to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about what RDA is exactly, why RDA, what were the reasons seen as necessary for these, why these changes were necessary. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about a conceptual model known as FERBER. That is what RDA is based on, and I think it's kind of important to have a little bit of knowledge about it. If you're going to be talking about RDA, you need to understand FERBER a little bit. Then we'll get down to the nuts and bolts. What will be different now? What are we going to need to know in order to create new records under RDA, in order to copy catalog and deal with RDA records coming into our catalogs? Um, I also want to talk a little bit more abstractly about what might be different later. You know, there are some changes and possible benefits of RDA that really aren't going to be recognized right away in our current environment, but I like to talk a little bit about things that might happen down the road. And then kind of jump back into practical things for a little bit. How should you prepare for RDA? So first of all, what is RDA? Well, the most basic answer to that is what does it stand for? It stands for Resource Description and Access. And it is a cataloging code designed to replace AACR2, the Anglo-American Cataloging Rules, second edition, which is what we currently catalog under. Um, it's interesting that whereas AACR2 is referred to as rules, RDA a lot of times uses the phrases guidelines or instructions, as if they're trying to make this a little bit less strict environment for cataloging. Um, and we'll see as we go along that there are kind of some scenarios with RDA where catalogers judgment kind of comes into play a little bit more and so it, it does seem like it's a little bit more flexible than AACR2 perhaps. Um, one thing you will hear said a lot about RDA is that it's a content standard, not a display standard or an encoding standard. And what that means basically is that it is strictly telling us what to put into our catalog records. Um, it's not telling us anything about how that should be displayed in our catalogs. And this is a little bit of a change from AACR2. AACR2 is a content standard, but it's also a display standard to the extent that it uses, for example, it tells you what punctuation to use. It tells you that there should be a space, colon, space between a subfield A and a subfield B in your title field, for example. Um, it is based on what's called ISBD punctuation and display. And actually, ISBD, which is the International Standards for Bibliographic Description, that ACR2 has built off a lot of that, and it has a lot to say about how these records are going to display. RDA kind of just tells you what to put in these chunks of information that are going in your catalog record and doesn't say a lot about how they're going to look when they show up in your catalog. So that's what I mean when I say it's a content standard, but not a display standard. It's also not an encoding standard. This means that it's not MARC. MARC does still exist. MARC is separate from RDA. You know, I hear a lot of people kind of shorthand refer to, well, we have MARC records now, and we're going to have RDA records in the future. And that's a mis... mis, mis oh, wait a minute. You're misspeaking if you're saying that. We're still going to be using MARC with RDA. Um, we were using MARC with AACR2. Someday down the road, we may not be using MARC in order to encode our records, in order to exchange our records. I should take a step back here and just say that MARC is what allows us to manipulate the records 
with a computer, basically. If you download records from a vendor or from the Library of Congress, the reason you can upload them into your catalog is because they're encoded in MARC, and your catalog understands that. Um, the reason your catalog knows how to display your records and knows what the title is and knows how to search your records is because they're encoded in MARC. So right now, RDA is not changing MARC other than the fact that a few new fields will be added. But perhaps down the road, and we'll talk about this later, we will be moving away from MARC as well. But RDA does not say anything about how you encode your records, and you could use something other than MARC. Here's the story so far with RDA as far as the timeline goes. In 2003, work started on what was then called AACR3. They thought they were just going to revise the rules. And a couple years into that, they realized that, no, I think we really need to make a big change and totally have a new set of rules. And so they started calling it Resource Description and Access. And they changed. there was a joint steering committee for work on AACR3, and now it was the joint steering committee for work on RDA. So RDA was finally published in 2010, and I say that finally because there were a number of delays. I was in library school from 2005 to 2008, and they kept saying, oh yeah, it's coming, it's coming, it's just around the corner, and it was not. <laughs> and so it seemed for a while like it might never get here, but finally in June of 2010, RDA was published, and a test period started. Um, RDA was tested by the National Libraries. When I say the National Libraries, I mean the Library of Congress, the National Library of Medicine, and the National agricultural library. And they, those libraries plus about 25, 26 test partners tested RDA and made some recommendations for changes. And then after that, the national libraries were going to announce whether or not they were going to implement RDA. And at the end of the testing period, it was announced that RDA would be implemented. The first announcement was no earlier than January of 2013. So it was kind of a vague date, but eventually they came out and set a firm implementation date, March 31st of 2013, which is just a few days away now, is when the Library of Congress and the National Libraries will start cataloging in RDA. So regardless of what you choose to do in terms of original cataloging records, you're going to see start seeing a lot more records coming in if you're copy cataloging in a few days when RDA is officially implemented. So that's the basics of what RDA is. Does anybody have any questions at this point? I'm going to try and stop at each of these junctures to see if there are questions. OK. And then we'll go on to a little bit of why RDA. Why was this change necessary? Well, in short, because it's not the 1970s anymore, um, AACR2 was written in the late 1970s, I think started to be implemented in 1980, and a lot of things have changed since then. The catalogs have changed. We don't use cards anymore. A lot of the things that are included in AACR2 are still kind of based on card catalogs, and we abbreviate things because we had limited space on the little cards. Um, the whole concept of a main entry, for example, is something that really relies on a card catalog environment. So RDA was established, or the, one of the ideas behind RDA was to get away from the card catalog environment, recognize that we are working with online computerized catalogs for the most part here. And we don't have to restrict ourselves based on card catalogs. In addition, the things that we catalog have changed. Um, ASR2 is very, very format-based. You know, there's a separate chapter for every type of resource. Um, there's a chapter for electronic resources. There's a chapter for three-dimensional objects. But it's, and all these chapters were kind of added on as afterthoughts because our ASR2 was originally set up for book cataloging, and so these other formats are kind of shoehorned into a book cataloging format. You know, now we're dealing with things that weren't even around when ASCR2 was written. You know, we have CD-ROMs, we have electronic resources, are meeting, you know, online streaming videos, things like that. And with ASCR2, the way it's kind of set up, you sort of have to keep continually adding chapters for new formats. 
And so with RDA, the idea was to make it more flexible, to make rules that apply to all resources so that you can kind of more seamlessly work with new formats as they become available. We want to allow these rules to work with things that we don't can't even imagine yet. Basically, yes, our formats will continue to change, and so we want a little bit more flexibility in our cataloging rules. Beyond that, the information universe has changed. We are not the only players when it comes to bibliographic records anymore. Um, people can find information about resources from Google, from Amazon, from publishers' websites, and so we want our information to be able to work with the information provided by other people out there on the web. You know, it can kind of be a, a two-way street. We want our information to be usable by them. We want to be able to use some of the information provided by other people. So that's another thing that RDA was kind of thinking about. Any other questions at this point? Okay, at this point we're going to take a step and talk a little bit about a conceptual model called Ferber. And most people sort of pronounce the acronym as FERBER. You'll hear it as FRBR sometimes, but it stands for Functional Requirements for Bibliographic Records. And basically, it's just a conceptual way of thinking about how our users of our library catalogs interact with our catalogs and what they want to be able to do, and how we can think about the items that are in our catalogs, the things that people will find when they search our catalogs. One part of Ferber that's important is that it's based on user tasks. It's talking about what people want to do with our catalogs. And the four user tasks are find, identify, select, and obtain. And there's another acronym you'll see when you hear people talking about Ferber. These are the things that people want to do. They want to find entities that correspond to their search criteria. So if they type something, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, into a catalog and search box and they get back this list of results, they've completed that task. They have found entities that relate to their search criteria. Then they want to identify the one that will work best for them. They want to confirm that the one that they found corresponds to the ones they were looking for, or to distinguish ones between um, similar characteristics. So. You, you look at this list and they say, well, some of these are not Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, but some of them are, and so these are the ones that I'm looking for. Next, they want to be able to select an entity that's appropriate to their needs. So they can go and look at all the versions of Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter and can say, well, this one's the print book, this one is a downloadable audiobook, this one is a compact disc audiobook, and so they can select the one that meets their needs. And then they want to obtain this. They want to acquire or obtain access to the entity. So they either want to be able to click on a link to download the downloadable audiobook. They want to find out where on the shelf the print book is, in this case they're looking at the print book and you see the locations of the various branches of the library where it is, and so that is what they want to do in order to be able to obtain their item. Now the other thing to know about Ferber is that it's a an entity relationship model, and I'll explain a little bit more about what that means. Part of an entity relationship model is obviously entities. They're basically things which are recognized as being capable of independent existence. Um, they can be uniquely identified. So an author is an entity. Um, a particular book that's being cataloged is an entity. So just think of an entity as a thing, basically. And then entities have attributes. Attributes are 
things that describe the entities. Basically, think of them as being adjectives that describe nouns, sort of. Um, attributes modify entities in order to tell us more about them. An attribute of a book could be its title or its publisher. And entities have relationships between each other, hence the name an entity relationship model. Relationships are basically links between entities. An author is related to a book. That's a link between two entities. An author, you know, if you say Charles Dickens is the author of A Christmas Carol, is author of is the link between the two entities. Ferber has three groups of entities, and get used to these terminology because you're going to see this in the RDA rules. Group one deals with the items that are in our catalog, and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail. But basically, there are different ways of thinking about the materials that we're cataloging, and they can be a work, expression, manifesta manifestation, or an item. Then group two is the people who are responsible for creating these items. And then group three is things that can be the subject of an item. So, you know, things that would be subject headings. So, you know, a book can be about a concept or a place or an event. And it can also be about another book or about a person. So group one and two entities also belong in group three here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the group one entities here, because that's kind of important to understand when it comes to RDA. When you say, I read that book, you can be talking about different levels of specificity. You know, when you say, I read that book, you can be talking about, oh, I read the Christmas, uh, Christmas Carol, and it doesn't matter which version of it, which trans if it was in a, translated in a particular language, if it's you know, published by a particular publisher. It's just sort of the conceptual idea of A Christmas Carol. And in Ferber terms, that is a work. A work is kind of the abstract thought as it appears in the author's head. You know, it's not related to any physical item at this point. It's just the abstract concept of a particular creative work. Then it's realized through an expression. Um, and expressions still kind of abstract. It doesn't relate to any particular edition of a work or anything like that. Um, one thing kind of useful, um, a translation of a work is a different expression. So if a work was originally written in Spanish and then translated into English, each of those things are different expressions. Now when we actually get to cataloging, you're mostly going to be talking about manifestations. Most of what we work with when we're cataloging is relates to a particular manifestation of a book. So, you know, and that is actually where we're starting to talk about the concept of a physical book, you know, a particular edition issued by a particular publisher would be a manifestation. If a book was published by Penguin Books and then later on republished by HarperCollins, those would be two different manifestations. But all the distinct copies of that particular edition would be grouped together in that manifestation. When you're talking about an item, you're talking about one particular book. You know, when I said when you said I read that book, you could be referring to the the abstract concept of a work, but you would say, here is this book that I'm going to put on the shelf. You have one particular item in your hand. That is an item. So item is the most specific thing you can deal with. And some of your cataloging might deal with that if you're, you know, making it up that um, a particular copy of a book was signed by the author or something like that. But again, most of your cataloging is going to be at the manifestation level. And here is a diagram of how the various groups of entities can relate to each other. Um, we have those group one entities again, work, expression, manifestation, and item. And then you see over on the side the group two entities, which actually I see that my earlier slide did not include family. That is a valid group two entity, a person or a family or a corporate body could um, create one of the group one entities. And then the group three entities 
are basically subject headings. They're what a work is about. So that was a really, really, really quick introduction to Ferber. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? I know it's really kind of conceptual and abstract. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions coming in here. So let's get into some of the nuts and bolts. This is probably, I'm guessing most of you are here to find out what the heck is going to be different when we are talking about RDA implementation. Well, for one thing, the structure of RDA is different. You know, when you're just sitting there looking at the table of contents, you'll notice that it looks a lot different than AACR2. The first section is about recording attributes. And again, we're using kind of the lingo of Ferber and entity attribute entity relationship models. So that's why I wanted to show you that. Um, the whole first section is about recording attributes of manifestation and item, of works and expression, of person, family, and corporate body. And then I have section four grayed out there because that's not actually a part of RDA yet. Um, that is a difference. ASAR2 didn't have anything to say about subjects. And RDA will, but it does not yet. This second part, recording attributes, was the first part. And now I have the second part was recording relationships. And this is where you make you know explicit of saying who was the author of an item, how do different, I should say, a work, an author relates to a work, um, how do different works relate to each other. You know, it says you can record relationships between works, expressions, and manifestations. Um, for example, you know, if you want to say that a movie of Romeo and Juliet was based on the play, or if you want to say that West Side Story is related to Romeo and Juliet, there are ways to do that with RDA. Again, not fully recognized in Mark yet, but perhaps down the road it will be more obvious. And I don't remember if I used the terminology yet of elements. Um, in these various sections, especially when you're recording attributes, they will be talking about elements, elements that relate to the manifestation and the item, elements that relate to the work and expression. Um, and so we have to get used in thinking of elements. Again, talking about an, um, an entity relationship model, we're kind of thinking about elements and how they relate to either a work, an expression, a manifestation, or an item. Um, we're used to thinking in areas of description. With ASCR2, this is one way in which it's based on ISBD. The eight areas of description come from the International Standards for Bibliographic Description. And a lot of different types of information are contained in one area. Um, for example, here's a publication statement. We have the place of publication. We have the name of the publisher. We have the date of publication. Those are all kind of contained in one area of description together. In RDA, they are technically separate elements. And so if you were just purely cataloging something in RDA without having to have regard for Mark, you would just see them sort of in a list of separate elements. Again, we're still kind of shoehorning RDA into Mark, and so it will still appear in altogether in one field. But technically, we have to kind of get used to thinking of smaller chunks of information instead of areas. And this kind of goes back to that whole thing about being able to relate to other bibliographic resources out there on the web. If you can more precisely identify individual chunks of information, then it's more it's easier to, you know, program a computer to recognize one particular type of information and if you wanted to pull all of that out and get it to interact with something else, you can do that kind of going along with the idea of elements, some of them are core and some of them are not. You'll see, when you're reading about RDA, you'll see the concepts of core elements. Um, some elements are defined as core in RDA. This means that this is the absolute bare minimum you need to include in order to have an RDA record, basically. 
some elements are core in certain circumstances. They're kind of referred to as core if elements. Um, the Library of Congress, for example, treats some additional elements as core. If you read their documentation, you will see that they've expanded a bit on the basic core elements from RDA. Um, and that's the smart thing to do because really, you know, there are some parts of a record that I think we would all pretty much consider to be important basic parts of a record like subtitles. Um, but subtitles or other title information are not considered to be core under RDA, but the Library of Congress has included them in their core elements. And so libraries can make their own local decisions about core elements, which, what are they going to say? Yes, we are absolutely going to include these. And so again, this is kind of getting into what I was talking to about with RDA being kind of based on catalogers' judgment or local policies, I guess. You know, you want to do things consistently within your own library but you can decide what is going to be core and what is not. But core just means mandatory element, basically. Another change that you'll notice with RDA is some changes in terminology. With AACR2, we used to talk about headings. Um, we're going to be talking more about access points with RDA. I mean, we used that term before with ASR2, but we're kind of using it exclusively. When you're talking about an authority record, the heading, the term that you're actually going to use, you call that an authorized access point now. And C references are variant access points. Um, C also references are authorized access points for related entry. Um, physical description is kind of called carrier description now. And we'll talk about more about this later, but an important distinction is that the general material designation is gone. The GMD, you know, the, the thing that appears in brackets after the title to tell you what kind of resource you're looking at, has been replaced by three elements called content type, media type, and carrier type. Another change in terminology you might notice is that the chief source of information is now called the preferred source of information. There's a little bit more flexibility in terms of where you can get information from. Um, instead of just specifying one chief source of information, there's usually more flexibility, usually more alternatives provided. One thing you will notice about RDA is that there are a lot fewer abbreviations. Words are going to be spelled out. Um, and this applies to things that are recorded, you know, not things that appear on the item. So when you're um, describing the physical description, the carrier description, um, the word pages is spelled out now. The word illustrations is spelled out now. You will notice that Centimeters still appears to be abbreviation, CM. Um, the reason given for that is that CM is not actually abbreviation, but it is a symbol held by the international community. So keep that in mind. You will still see CM in RDA records. Along with those lack of abbreviations, you will see lack of Latin abbreviations. So remember under ASAR2 when we did not know where an item was published or what the name of the publisher is, we would use Latin abbreviations S period L period and S period N period for CNA loco and CNA nomine without a place and without a name. We are no longer going to do that. Um, when it comes to place of publication, in the RDA rules it says you can use the phrase place of publication not identified in brackets. Library of Congress practice is to always at least take a guess at the place. So supply it. If you're not sure, put a question mark after it. Um, so you will probably rarely see place of publication not identified, at least not in a Library of Congress record. If you don't know the publisher, you can still use publisher not identified in brackets. But we're not using those Latin abbreviations anymore, which I always joke that it's kind of a shame now that I can't make use of the Latin that I used in college. This was really the only place I got to use it <laughs> anymore. But that's OK. Another place where you will not see Latin abbreviations anymore is when it comes to inaccuracies in titles. Before, under ASCR2, we did what was appears in the bottom there. 
magnetic was spelled wrong, so they put sick, another Latin word, in brackets afterwards. In According to RDA, you simply transcribe it as appears on the item, and then add a note or a title added entry, and so in that case, that title should read Micromagnetic Study. That would probably go in a 246 field so that it could still be found under this and so that a note would appear. And I see a question coming in. Our first question, yay. Um, wanting to know if the commission will offer a class where we actually fill out RDA-style records. Yes, I do have plans in the works for a full-day RDA workshop. Probably offer one on the eastern side of the state and one out in further west, perhaps in Kearney. Um, so yes, if this is all seeming really overwhelming to you and you, you want a chance to get your hands on this, you will have that chance through an RDA wor workshop from the commission. Yes, <laughs> our comment says, thank you, I'm a learner by doing. Yes, I think especially when it comes to RDA, it really, a lot of it just kind of goes over your head until um, you actually get a chance to do it. I have found that by myself, too. I have another question coming in asking, how will we know if it's abbreviation versus a symbol? Um, that information is actually given in the RDA rules. Really, as far as I can think, um, CM, I think, is the only one that is actually a symbol, so you can just remember that one on its own. I have another question coming in. It says, can we continue to enter the GMD regardless of RDA? That's a very good question, and um, we're going to touch on that more. But yes, I mean, really, locally, it's up to you. I know for a fact I've spoken to um, people at Omaha Public Library, and they said, yes, you know, our patrons use that. We are going to continue to put the GMD in the 245 field. So um, we will try and make that. So, I mean, you're not just a local decision. You know, as we'll see here, there are a lot, and when I talk about the practical applications of um, RDA and decisions you'll have to make, that is one of them. If you think that records as they currently appear with the GMD really help your patrons or your staff, then you may want to continue putting that in there, regardless of the fact that it's technically not correct under RDA. Good question. Okay, so another difference about RDA is the rule of three when it comes to the statement of responsibility no longer applies. And the rule of three basically said before that if there are more than three people um, responsible for an item, more than three authors, you only include the first person's name and then another Latin abbreviation you include et al. to indicate that yes, there are others. With RDA, there is no such rule of three anymore. You can include four authors. You can include 18 authors if you want to. Um, and they just all get transcribed in the statement of responsibility. Or if you know you do have 18 authors and you don't have time to transcribe them all, um, there is an optional omission. You can put the first name and then and three others or and 17 others, however many, in brackets afterwards. Um, this also... Um, creates new possibilities for access points. You can go ahead and create added entries for, um, I guess added entry is not technically the right word under RDA anymore, but access points in 700 fields for all of those people who are named, even though you're only required to have an access point for the first person. Um, so I think that kind of opens up new possibilities as far as authors being able to be found with their associated resources. Um, the example I gave before of fewer abbreviations came from a field that was recorded where you know, you're supplying the information. It's not stuff you're transcribing from the item, but it also applies to transcribed fields and goes along with sort of a principle of RDA, which is to take what you see. So if the item has things spelled out, 
then you don't need to abbreviate them. Under ASAR2, there were these very specific abbreviations, and again, we're working with a card catalog environment, so if the item was had an edition statement, for example, that said third edition, with both third and edition spelled out, you would still abbreviate, you were told to abbreviate edition ED period, and you were told to use the numeral form of third instead of writing it out. Um, with RDA, that is not the case anymore. If the words are spelled out on the item, that is how you put them in your record. If they're abbreviated on the item, that's how you put them in the record. Um, you'd also don't leave out things like titles. Under RDA, I mean, under ASAR2, the bottom example, you would take out doctor. Under RDA, you leave it in, if that's how it appears on the item. Again, more transcription. Take what you see. Under ASAR2, if you remember, there was an appendix with a list of how you're supposed to abbreviate country names and state names. And, you know, they didn't correspond to postal codes, and people, when they're new to cataloging, get kind of frustrated having to learn them. Well, they're gone. In when it comes to, for example, place of publication, you just transcribe what you see on the item. If it uses the postal code for a state, you go ahead and use that. If it doesn't include the state, you don't include it. If it spells out the state, you go ahead and spell it out. If it had Illinois written out all the way there, you would include Chicago, comma, Illinois. Let's see, we've got a couple questions. Um, to take what you see include credentials such as PhD, MA? Yes, that is correct. If you have somebody listed on the, the title page as such and such PhD, you would go ahead and include that. Um, question regarding honorific titles, does that only apply in forward notations or in authorship as well? Um, I believe it's in authorship as well. You should include all titles. Now here's what I was talking about before with the GMD, the General Material Designation. Um, the bottom example is what you might be used to seeing right now. You know, in order to tell somebody that, hey, this is a video recording, you have the name of the video recording. For example, this might be a DVD of Avatar, and you would put video recording in brackets, and that would go in the 245 field, subfield H. And it's going to be replaced by three new elements called content type, media type, and carrier type. And we'll talk a little bit more about these later when we start talking about new mark fields because that is one of the main areas where there are new mark fields. Um, but basically, the reason for this is um, the GMDs were kind of, a lot of people thought it was kind of mixing up content versus media versus carrier. Something's kind of referred to a broader, more abstract concept of what something is, while others were very, very specific about saying that it was a sound disc or it was, you know, uh, it was a, yeah, video cassette, something like that. Um, and yes, I'm seeing somebody has caught a typo on my screen. Um, that last line up there, video disc, RDA, space, carrier, there should not be a space between carrier. Um, what you're looking at there, and it's harder to tell without the mark code there, but I wanted to kind of introduce this without mark to begin with, was there is uh, a set terminology for each of these elements. There, you, know, you don't make up what these things are. You choose from a list that is in the RDA rules, and they're also available online. The Library of Congress website has them available of what to call these things. So for a DVD, content type is sort of the most abstract way of thinking about something. You're saying that it's a video item, or it's you know a two-dimensional moving image. This one is really um, 
long and drawn out, but for a book, for example, it would be text. You're saying that it's a text item. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a print book, if it's an e-book, if it's you know a PDF file online. Those are all text items. It doesn't matter what the physical form is. It's the abstract way of thinking about the content. Um, media type gets a little more specific, and it's sort of it's basically identifying the type of item needed to access something. Basically, so all video items have the same media type of video. All audio items have the same media type of audio, but you're still not specifically referring to what the actual item is. Aha, and I see another question coming in, which is, yes, one that I always anticipate when talking about this. No, there is still not a way to specify between a Blu-ray disc or a DVD disc or a mini disc. You know, a lot of people complained about the GMD was that it's not specific enough. A lot of people I know get rid of video recording and put DVD in there. And out of all the things that RDA could have fixed, it did not <laughs> fix this. Um, although, again, when we're talking about um, mark fields, they are kind of working on a way to shoehorn that in. So hold that thought for a little bit. But as the rules stand, there was a lot of people's complaint was you still did not fix the problem of GMDs not being specific enough. But we will see kind of a fix for that later on when we're talking about mark fields. Good question. But basically, the reason for these new elements, I think I got distracted from what I was saying before when I <laughs> saw the comment about the typo, but um, the reason for these new elements was that the GMD terms are kind of a mishmash of all of these, of content type and carrier type, and also that you have to decide on one, basically. Um, if you have something like a streaming video that can be an online resource or can be a video recording, you can't bring out both of those in the GMD. You have to choose one. Or with playaways, for example, some people say they're sound recordings, and some people say they're electronic resources, and I think the decision that was made was to officially use electronic resource in the GMD. But it's kind of a shame that you can't bring out more than one aspect of that. So that's a reason for content type, media type, and carrier type. You can repeat them. You can bring out more than one aspect of an item. And again, we'll see that more when we're talking about mark fields. Um, another difference that you'll see with RDA is um, not something that we never did before, but something that's going to be more prevalent is actually specifying relator terms for how people relate to a particular work, a particular piece of material that you're cataloging. Um, again, remember, this is based on Ferber, which is all about entities and relationships, and so we want to be kind of explicit about how the relationships are are formed, you know, how people are related. You know, basically, yes, when you see a name in a 100 field, you can assume that it's the author, but we want to make that more explicit. So you will see, you know, a name heading in the 100 field, and I'll say more about those dates later, but, and then comma, author, making it very explicit. And there was a list of terms in the, the RDA index that you could choose from for people who are related to whatever you are cataloging. And the things coming out of Library of Congress that I've seen so far seem kind of inconsistent as to whether they're using these. Not all of the 100 fields have them, and so I'm, I'm going to have to go and double check and see what their policy is on this. I don't know if that's just inconsistency because people are not used to it yet or because they actually haven't made it mandatory to use these. You know, I, they're not core elements in terms of the pure RDA rules that I'm aware of, but Again, I've sort of seen some LC records with them and some without, so I will have to check and see what their official policy on that is. So that makes a nice segue into talking about some of the changes in headings. Um, you noticed before that the word approximately appears in this person's headings if they're not sure what the birth date is. Previously, under ASAR2, they would use the abbreviation for circa, and we're going to get rid of that and spell out approximately. Um, also, there are things like you would see people with FL 
period, which abbreviates for flourished, which is the time that they were basically active. And um, under RDA, you're going to spell out the word active instead of using the FL abbreviation. Another change is that under Bible headings, previously when you're referring to a specific book of the Bible, it would be Bible and then either NT or OT to indicate that it's from the New Testament or the Old Testament, and then the actual name of the book of the Bible. And in, under RDA, you're going to get rid of the, the middleman there, the NT or OT. We're just going to go straight for the Bible and then the book that it you're talking about. Another difference is that we're heading again towards using fewer abbreviations and spelling things out, and so department is one that's a big time change, um, especially affects us here at the commission when we catalog things from various state agencies. And so the word department is going to be spelled out, and the Library of Congress has already started changing their authority records for this. I've been busy this month downloading and changing our records to spell out the word department. Okay, before I move on talking about mark fields, are there any other questions at this point? You guys have been really great about just jumping in with questions, so that's good. Okay, so as I said, there are new mark fields for the content type, media type, and carrier type. They are 336, 337, and 338. 336 is for content type, 337 is for media type, and 338 is for carrier type. Again, in subfield A, that is where you put the authorized term that you would choose from the list in the RDA rules. That first one is an example of what it would look like for a book. And yes, this is a change, you know, most people practice under ASR2 was not to include a GMD for text items, but with RDA you should do it for all items for these new elements. So the subfield A is the term itself, and then subfield 2 is the source of the term basically, and since we're using terms from the RDA vocabularies, that's RDA content is the code for RDA content type terms, RDA media is the code for RDA media type terms, and RDA carrier is the code for RDA carrier type terms. So those will generally always be the same, because at this point we're not using terms from any other vocabulary. And as I've said before, you can repeat these. Um, if you have, for example, a streaming video that is both a computer resource and a video resource when it comes to media type, you can include them. That second example has a repeated 337. There's really a lot of room for variation on these things. Um, you'll see that this first example on this slide has subfield Bs, um, which we did not see before. Those are for codes that represent the same thing that's found in subfield A. So um, basically in this example, A and B are kind of redundant. Um, you might want to have them both if you were going to want whatever in subfield A to display, display to your users, but you wanted the computer to be able to manipulate those codes behind the scenes. Um, you could technically not have the subfield A and just have the subfield B. The whole kind of idea about these new elements, these new mark fields, I think, is that eventually we'll be able to do more with them than we currently do. Right now they look kind of clunky when they're in your catalog, um, but I can see them being used kind of behind the scenes as ways to limit searches to particular types of formats, and so um, those codes rather than the terms are something that would perhaps allow you to do that. Um, so that's something you might see. It still has that subfield 2 for telling you where the term came from, but you could either have just A or just B or both. 
Now that second chunk of code there, um, I want to use to explain two different things. Number one, you'll notice that there are two 336 fields, there are two 337 fields, and there are two 338 fields. And basically, um, that's why I said before, these fields are repeatable. You don't have to choose between, you know, whether it's something like a streaming video that one resource contains um, multiple aspects, or whether it's something where you have both a book that comes with a CD, and you want to be able to bring things out about both of them. And that's what we have in this case. There's a 336, 337, and 338 for the book, and then there's the same fields for the CD. Now another thing you'll see here is the subfield 3 at the beginning of the fields. This is where, what I was saying before, if you want to kind of use common language terms, you can do that. You notice it says CD. It doesn't say sound disk, audio disk, any, you know, it doesn't say anything that doesn't make sense to your patrons. So if you had a video, a, a DVD here, or a Blu-ray, that's where you could put these in here. These don't have to be terms from any specified vocabulary. Um, it also kind of helps to bring together which of these fields are referring to what. You can see all the ones that have book in there, and you know that, okay, those all refer to the book. You can see the ones that have CD and go, okay, those all refer to the CD. Um, I have a question coming in. Can we use this version in place of subfield A, online resource, subfield 2, RDA carrier? Um, by this version, you mean with the subfield 3, with a CD or you know some kind of um, okay yes with some kind of um, yes if you found something that you would want to put in there that would be more meaningful to your patrons you can do that um, not necessarily in place but in addition to so you would still have online resource in your subfield A but then if you wanted to put website or something in your subfield three you could do that. Another new field is the 264 field. Um, this is going to replace the 260 field for when it comes to dealing with things like publication information. Um, they just figured that redefining a new field would make it easier to be able to distinguish between types of information. They realized that the 260 kind of lumps together a lot of different types of information it can relate to production, publication, distribution, manufacture, or copyright information. And so they wanted to use indicators to be able to tell people which type of information is available. Um, most of the time you'll probably see the first indicator being blank, but it can be used if you're going to have multiple fields to indicate an earlier publisher and a later publisher. And then the second indicator is where you'll be able to tell what type of information you're dealing with here. Um, whether it's production information, publication information, distribution, or manufacturing, or copyright. Um, again, kind of going back to the idea of distinct elements, you know, with ASCR2 in the publication statement in the 260 field, copyright date and publication date were kind of a murky thing where you kind of could use the copyright date instead of the publication date, and with RDA, they want them to be two distinct things. There's a different element for publication date and there's a different element for copyright date. So if you were going to include the copyright date, you would put that in its own field and the second indicator would be for to indicate that this is a copyright date, not a publication date. Oh, yes, 264 is repeatable. I got a question coming in asking, saying that it sounds like 264 is repeatable. That, that is absolutely correct. Um, I have seen 264s be repeated, like I said, to indicate an earlier publisher and a later publisher of, like, a serial. Um, I also seen it, you know, people put all the publication information in 264 and then repeat it and just put a copyright date in another 264 field if the copyright date is different than the publication date.
There are also a few new mark fields that relate to particular types of that's okay. Uh, resources, they would not reply to everything. Like I said, most of RDA is designed to apply to all types of resources, but there are a few fields that need to be um, specified with a little bit more specific elements. So there are certain sound characteristics that go in 344, um, certain projection characteristics of moving images that go in 345, um, video characteristics, 346, and things like, you know, running time for a video is what we're talking about with these things. Um, and digital file characteristics go in 347. Um, one that's not a new mark field necessarily, but something that you'll see, or a new subfield, I suppose, and something that is definitely useful to point out as a signpost for an RDA record is the O4O field, where it usually just has the symbols for people who created the record, um, a subfield E is used for descriptive conventions, and RDA records should contain a subfield E that just says RDA. That's the code to be used. This is also useful because it allows people to search for RDA records. If you're looking for examples of RDA records, you can do that, and we will go over that in a little bit on how to do that. But one thing I wanted to point out is that with these new mark fields, you can set, if you use OCLC Connection for doing your original cataloging, you can set it so that you get these RDA fields included in your template when you create a new record. Um, and under Tools, you get the Options screen, you can have a little checkbox there that says use RDA workforms when creating new bibliographic records and new authority records. And so if you check those boxes, then you will have these 33x fields and the 264 field, etc., in your records when you create new ones. So if you have those enabled, this is what it would look like. You can see that there is um, a subfield E with RDA already populated in there, um, in the 040 field. There has a 336, 337, and 338 field, things like that. Um, your 100 field has a subfield E that relates to your relator terms that I talked about before. So if you want to set up your connection to do that, you can. There are also some differences in authority records. These are the list of mark fields that are included in authority records. <coughs> Let's see. I have a question. Um, do, does that work on web access as well as the client? I believe so. And um, you put me on the spot here because I almost never use browser, but I believe there is a way to set up RDA options as well in the browser. I don't know the exact steps to do it, but I feel like I... I have read that you can do that as well. Good question. We have a question coming in. If we catalog an original record after April 1st, do we have to use RDA? No, you do not. It is up to you. You can continue using a 2 if you want to. Um, and I do... I just saw that our, our OCLC has another webinar, I think April 17th, talking about their policy for RDA, and so you might want to keep your eye out for that. Um, they will you know, be kind of updating their policies as to what you can contribute, but as of right now, I, I believe that no, you are still free to go ahead and contribute ASCR2 records if you want to. Um, you don't have to contribute to RDA records only. So as you can tell from these new fields, authority records are going to look a lot different under RDA. Um, and these are just efforts to supply a lot more information about the people um, and corporate bodies, etc., in an authority record. So after this, you might want to see some examples of um, RDA records. Um, 
the RDA toolkit, which again we'll talk about later, but that is the online product where RDA rules are available. On their website, they do have some examples of MARC records. Let's see if I can get this to open up. One second here. Let me drag my browser window over. They have examples of both authority records and bibliographic records. And one thing I think that's interesting is they have both kind of non-MARC and MARC records. Um, they have non-MARC first relating to the RDA element and the rules of where you can find information about this. So I think this is a good way of kind of getting yourself familiar with the rules. And then they have MARC versions of it with the same information plugged into a MARC record. Diane, I need to see the baby. If you would like to um, search in OCLC Connection, if you have access to WorldCat, if you have um, access to Connection and you can search the WorldCat records. Oh, she can come in. Let's see. Um, a question coming in. If a person is identified as an author or an illustrator or an editor or a contributor on different manifestations, does this person have one or multiple authority records? They would have one record, but all of their um, different roles could be included in the field of activity or you know things that their occupation. If there's multiple things. Um, I guess when it comes to an author versus an editor, it might not be specified on an authority record, but if it was, you know, if they were an author and a painter or a ballerina or things that were, um, those would maybe go in occupation and you can repeat the, the subfield so they can have more than one role specified in one authority record. Good question. Okay. Um, let's see here. Yeah, but I have a comment coming in that they can hear some background noise. I do kind of hear, I think, somebody talking in the background. I thought I had everybody's microphones muted, but... Let's see. If you don't want people to hear you, um, there should be a green microphone on the top of your GoToWebinar control panel. If you can click that, then we won't be able to hear everybody. If you're looking for examples of RDA records in OCLC WorldCat, you can search if you have connection. Um, you can do a search in descriptive conventions, or if you're using a command line, dx colon, just search for RDA. I'll show you screenshots here that will make this make more sense in a minute. Um, if you just do that, you'll get way too many records. Um, they will tell you there's too many records for you to perform your search. So you would probably want to add some limiters. Um, such as a year, a material type, a format. If you want to see what you have in your library, if you've been getting copy catalog records coming in, you can add a limiter for your own library. And if you want to get really specific, if you know you're still just getting way too many records, you can even add a limiter of the date created. Let me show you how to do these things. So when you have your search, You can. Um, you may need to first get more indexes available to search. You know, when you have your drop-down menu, 
probably oh. descriptive conventions won't be included in there, so you'll need to click on this plus button, and you'll, therefore you'll get more things you can choose from your drop-down menu. And when you want to choose descriptive conventions, and then put RDA in over here. And you can choose, you know, if you want to limit it by language, a particular format to get things down even more specific, um, a particular year created, you can do that. Um, if you want to get really specific, you can choose date created as mark and specify it has to be four digits for the year and then two for the month and two for the date. If you want to see what your own library has, you can choose holding library and then put in your OCLC code. So those are my basic overview of what might be different now. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, if you'll indulge me by getting a little bit more conceptual and abstract again, um, I want to talk about what might be different later. And one thing that might be different later, um, I always like to talk about are so-called ferberized catalogs. Um, where you can really see the difference in between how we search things now and how we search things later. And one example that I'd like to show off is kind of a prototype put out by the online audiovisual catalogers group, OLAC. They call it their moving image discovery interface. It's fairly new. It's so new that it doesn't have a catchier name than that yet. And let's see if this will work. If you do a search for Dracula, you know, all the ones that are a representation of this 1958 version are brought together. Um, a couple different VHS versions, a couple of the DVD version. You know, even if the DVD was issued in 2002, it's still a reproduction of the 1958 version, so they're brought together. You know, that's a little bit different than how we search our catalogs these days. Um, and then we have the 1992 version, and again, all the physical copies of it are brought together. Another example is Scurzo by Indiana University, and this relates to music. Yeah. Again, you'll kind of see there are areas of resources where RDA and Ferber are probably a little more useful than others, and one is with video items, and one is with music. You know, when it comes to music, in particular, especially with like classical music, a particular piece of music might appear on a number of different CDs. You know, the, a Mozart horn concerto could appear on a CD with um, a variety of Mozart works. It could appear on a CD with a variety of horn concertos. Um, and so this is cataloged to the level of individual pieces of music on an album. So And also with scores. So you can see, you know a much more granular level than a lot of our catalogs do now. But again, it's kind of what we're trying to get to with RDA and relationships between, in this case, individual pieces of music on a CD. Um, there's a catalog called Ostlit, which is put up by the National Library of Australia. And they have some samples you can look at. You have to actually subscribe to their database in order to be able to use it, but you can look at samples. And so, for example, if you look at this Broken Shore, it tells you about five different versions of it, alternate titles, 
um, it's kind of just organized a lot differently than what we're talking about here. Um, I'll always remember his birthday. And, for example, this one has, you know, the very, it's a collection of essays, and there's a different record for each essay, and it's broken out into a much more granular level than we're used to. Um, another thing that I think is could be possible with um, <coughs> excuse me the authority records in RDA is new search options. Um, what I mean by that is kind of um, the open library is something that I like to point to as an example of that. Um, right now, when our users come to our catalogs, mainly they're going to be searching for a list of things that we actually have in our libraries. And, you know, if you search for an author's name, you'll get a list of books by this author in our library. Um, let me see if I can get this link to open. The open library kind of does things a little bit differently, and though they're not using RDA, but this is something that I think RDA is working towards, which is emphasizing not just the actual items being cataloged, but also the people who contribute to them as entities in their own rights. And so in the open library, you can search for an author. And you get a whole page for them. You know, they have their own entity, basically. And <coughs> it doesn't just have a list of their works. It does, but also has bibliographic biographical information about them, subjects that she wrote about, places associated with her. Well, you can save it till Monday. And I feel like it's just a much richer experience than our patrons currently have with our library catalogs. And the thing that I can see making that possible would be the all that information that's in the new authority record. So rather than coming to the catalog with a known author, somebody searching for Jane Austen, they could come and look for, instead of that, women authors from England who wrote in the 1800s. And, you know, instead of just having to have a known item search in mind, they could search our catalogs in totally different ways and kind of narrow down their searches as they're trying to refine what they're searching for. Another thing that you'll see discussed a lot with RDA and um, kind of the wave of the future is the idea of the semantic web or linked data, um, terms that are kind of used interchangeably. Basically, the way I define the difference between the two is that linked data is something that makes up the semantic web. It makes the web, the semantic web, possible. Um, here's a really wordy official, quote unquote, definition of linked data, according to Wikipedia, if you consider that official. Um, it's a method of publishing structured data so it can be interleaked and become more useful. Um, it Basically, it encodes things so that computers can, to a certain extent, understand the content of what they're linking. Um, right now, this is kind of what the internet is like, what the World Wide Web is like. Um, there are all these monolithic resources, and there are links between them, but there's not really any particular meaning behind the links. In the semantic web, with linked data, web resources are broken down into smaller chunks of data, and these smaller pieces of data have links to each other. And there's also more meaning encoded um, with the relationships and with the pieces of data themselves. Right now, the web is encoded with HTML, Hypertext Markup Language, and usually the tags don't really have a lot to say about what information is contained between them. Um, this one, my example, actually happens to because H1 is for heading and P is for paragraph, but um, those tags don't tell the computer anything about what the words mean. You know, they just basically tell how to display. You know. The difference with that is that the heading is going to be displayed in a bigger text 
and perhaps a, a bolder font than what the paragraph is, but it doesn't tell the computer anything about what this information means. Here, by contrast, is an example of Resource Description Framework, or RDF, which is what linked data works with. And as you can see, if you were a computer trying to understand this information, we're talking about this particular album, and you know the computer can tell that Bob Dylan is the artist, and it was produced in the United States by Columbia, which is a company, and it costs 1090, which is a price, and it was released in 1985, which is a year. All this meaning is encoded into the um, the information into the computer coding, so they can understand it behind the scenes. And with this, relationships are key. Similarly to what we were talking about before with the Ferber and RDA itself, everything is based on relationships. You know, right now we're used to connecting pieces of information in our catalog records based on their context. You know, we have a Christmas Carol in the 245 field and Charles Dickens in the 100 field. We know that Charles Dickens is the author, but there's really nothing in that record that says that explicitly in a way that a computer could understand. Link data makes these more explicit. Um, it has what are called triples in RDF. They have three parts, subject, predicate, and object. Um, and basically, this is kind of like the relationships between the entities in Ferber I was talking about before. Christmas Carol is the subject, has author, is the predicate, and Charles Dickens is another entity, it's the object. So that is telling the computer that Charles Dickens is the author of A Christmas Carol. There's a distinct relationship between this. And then where it really shines is bringing in resources from various sources. The whole idea with linked data is that um, people should be able to reuse information that's created by somebody else. Um, again, this is our RDF screen, and Right now, this information all comes from the same source, but you know, if you were getting Bob Dylan's information from Wikipedia or um, you know, information about his record from a database out there on the web that deals with m music um, albums, um, the real, real value of linked data is bringing together resources from various places. And it's hard to really say what linked data looks like because really, um, on the front end, it doesn't look that different than a regular website. You don't necessarily know that this information is coming from various sources. For example, here's a project for Civil War data to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Um, it was started in 2011. And really, you know, it's just bringing together a lot of primary resources about the Civil War, but they come from various sources. And it's all pulled together kind of automatically behind the scenes with linked data. I mean, we have the various places of pulling from here, the Archives of Michigan, the Internet Archive, Freebase, History Pin. But on the surface, it really just looks like a website with various with information. And it's hard to tell that they're coming from various locations. So we have a question that says, right now we use HTML and we're going to use XML in the future. Um, yes, RDF is generally encoded in XML. That is correct. And so basically the XML will kind of interact with the HTML on the web. Um, we're not going to move away entirely from HTML because that still is how things are displayed on the web. But behind the scenes, there's going to be a lot more encoding with XML that kind of specifies the meaning of bibliographic information, yes. Um, and so I mentioned before about moving away from MARC. The Library of Congress has announced that, yes, they want to do that. Um, 
sort of after RDA is implemented, they're working towards MARC um, or MARC replacement. And the Bibliographic Framework Transition Initiative is their fancy name for the project to find something to replace MARC. Um, BibFrame is the abbreviation for it, and BibFrame.org is the website where you can find information about it. And yes, they specify that linked data is what they want to use instead of MARC. And so a company called Zephira is working with the Library of Congress on creating a model for linked data as it relates to bibliographic data. And so that's kind of an in-progress type of thing. But if you're interested in following along with that, you can keep up with bibframe.org. Okay, so the last section I have here is how to prepare for RDA. How do you implement RDA in your library? Um, one thing you'll want to do is decide when you will implement. As I said, you're not required yet to start creating RDA records automatically right away with Library of Congress, but you will have records coming in. If you do any copy cataloging at all, you will have, you probably already have See, you know, the Library of Congress has been creating RDA records off and on since their um, test of RDA in 2011. So if you are um, copy cataloging, you have RDA records and you will continue to do so. So even if you are not implementing on your own, you're going to be dealing with it and probably you'll get to the point where it will be much more efficient to implement. I don't necessarily recommend a no, we're not going to do RDA decision because then you're just going to be spending time editing the records that come in to be AACR2 records, basically, and it's just, I don't think that's a very efficient use of catalogers' time. Um, if you do want to make local decisions like continuing to add the GMD to incoming records, then you know that's something you want to think about also. Another thing that you will have to do is decide how you will access RDA. It was originally designed to be an online tool, and you can access that at rdatoolkit.org. Um, let's see, here is the pricing. I believe there's pricing information over here. Um, it will be an annual subscription. That's definitely a change. You know, one of the things about going to an online tool is that it's an annual subscription rather than a one-time purchase with maybe some updates every once in a while. Here are the basic pricing here. I did want to mention that we are working on getting a group purchase going here in Nebraska. Um, right now we have enough institutions that we can get a 10% discount on whatever these prices are here. So if you were looking for a solo user subscription, $195 a year, Um, if you want multiple users, but one at a time, it's $325, and then you can add on concurrent users. This is the price for each concurrent user, but for whatever your total is, currently we have enough institutions signed up to get a 10% discount off of that. If we can get 20 institutions signed up, we will bump up to a 15% discount. So keep that in mind, and contact me if you would like to be included in that purchase. There is also a print version of RDA. Um, originally, it was designed to only be available online, and enough people raised a stink about that being kind of cost prohibitive for small libraries. And so there is a print version that you can buy from ALA Publishing. ALA is the publisher here in the United States. It will you know, require updating. It won't be as up to date as the online version. But that is another option available. Another thing that you will have to do before getting ready is you'll probably want to talk to your ILS vendors. Um, make sure that you can display the new fields. Make sure that you can index them if you want them to be searchable. Things like the 264 for publisher information. If you want to be, you know, that to be included in a search, you'll have to let them know about that. And there are vendor interviews on the RDA Toolkit website. 
they've done a blog where they have got a series of interviews with people about how they're handling RDA. So you can start there if you want to read that before getting in touch with your representative. You'll need to think about authority control. You know, I mentioned some of those changes in the headings, like department being spelled out um, using the, you know, approximately instead of circa, um, the Bible headings changing. Let's see. Oh, I have a question coming in. No. Um, do you have to have a subscription to see vendor interviews? No, you do not. Um, the blog is a freely available part of the RDA Toolkit website. Um, that is something good to point out. There are a lot of resources on the website that you don't have to have a subscription to. Let's see. Um, if you were just going to rdatoolkit.org, click on the blog on the left-hand side over here, and that will get you to all the blog posts. And then they have categories over here. And you can get to the vendor interviews or any of these other things. But no, yeah, there is a lot of free content available on the RDA Toolkit website that is not protected by your subscription. But yes, back to the authority control. Um, you could potentially have a split file if you are not going to update old headings to accommodate the new spelling out of things or omitting the New Testament and Old Testament. And so think about what you're going to do if there's something you're going to spend time on, you know, replacing the old records with the new ones. Uh, and if you outsource this, talk to your vendor and see how they're going to handle this. And you'll want to plan for training. If you've not done so already, you will need to figure out who in your library needs to be trained, how you're going to do it, and when. As I mentioned, we will be offering some more workshops here through the Library Commission, so there will be training opportunities available. Um, I wanted to point out a few resources. I always like to include resources when giving my presentations. Um, ELECT, the Association for Library Collections and Technical Services the Division of ALA, they have an, uh, had a number of RDA webinars throughout the last several years, and usually you have to pay for them when they're first offered, but after a certain amount of time they do become freely available, and they have made all the freely available ones on a YouTube channel, so there is a YouTube playlist for RDA videos. Um, Adam Schiff at the University of Washington has been kind of a go-to guy for documenting the changes from AACR2 to RDA throughout the whole process, and he has been continually updating his website. He has a number of presentations. He has all these various versions of them. The most recent ones are down at the bottom, but it's a really nice just examples of things that are going to be different. You know, I haven't even managed to touch on everything here in this last couple hours. So definitely a good resource to go to. The Library of Congress has an RDA website. And it's being slow at the moment, but they have a number of good RDA resources. Including all of their training modules. They have made their training modules available on their website. And the last thing I want to mention is that here in Nebraska we have an RDA practice group that's been going on since for about a year now, a little bit over a year, where they meet once a month and get together and practice creating RDA records. And we do have a wiki. Um, which has a number of resources. Everything here on the left-hand side are useful resources. You can also look over on this side and see things that we have done for our past meetings. Um, I think I can get to the, let's see, Library of Congress training materials link, for example, is included in here. And they have a number of recorded webinars and the slides and um, exercises you can do to test yourself. So this is a really good resource for learning RDA. 
And if you would like to join the RDA practice group, we're still going. The next meeting is April 5th, and we'll be at Union College here in Lincoln. Does anybody else have any other questions? I know this is a lot to take in. It was kind of a basic basic overview of RDA and things that you want to be thinking about. As several of you have observed, learning by doing is probably the way to really wrap your head around a lot of RDA. And so if that is you, if you need um, hands-on practice, we will be offering workshops, as I said. And... Definitely, let, if, for those of you in Nebraska, if you are interested in a group purchase, please let us know as well if you would like to purchase access to the RDA toolkit. If there are no other questions, then I guess we will bring an end to the session. Um, I will send out um, the PowerPoint slides again. I set them up um, before the webinar, but I will make them available, and there will also be a recording of this. I will send out an email that will point you towards the recording when this is done. Thanks for joining us, and don't hesitate to contact me if you have questions about RDA.